the next part of the lesson is evidences in support of organic evolution if you want to understand the concept of evolution you have to observe the interrelationships between the existing organisms and relating the similarities with the extinct organisms so evolution could be understood best or better by observing the interrelationships between the existing organisms and relating the similarities with the extinct organisms these relationships are also supported by evidences from the various branches of biology now all these evidences supported the fact that life originated from a common ancestor or all living organisms have originated from a common ancestor that concept is called monophyletic origin monophyletic origin concept monophyletic origin that means common ancestor for all the existing living organisms now let's take first what evidences from comparative morphology and anatomy evidences from comparative morphology and anatomy morphology and anatomy this is number one comparative anatomy and morphology now the study of comparative morphology and anatomy normally explain that the organisms have a set of common characters a set of common characters a set of similarities in their characteristics now in this one we have to study different types of organs which have shown the similarities between the existing organisms and the past extinct organisms number one and this one what are homologous organs what are homologous organs Now, for example, if you are taking the four limbs of vertebrates, I am taking the example four limbs of vertebrates. Say an example of what is called human hand. Then the cat four limbs, or the flipper of whale, or the wing of bat, wing of bat. So. If you are comparing the four limbs of human hand, cat four limbs, flipper of whale, the pan-like structure used for swimming is called flipper because whale is an aquatic mammal, and wing of bat, they have shown similarities actually in their origin. So these organisms are actually dissimilar. and are adapted for doing different functions but they have same origin that means the mode of development and the basic structure of bone in all these structures would be the same or similar so homologous organs are those which are inherited from common ancestors with a similar developmental pattern simply we can say organs which have similar origin but have different functions now the human hand for multiple function the cat four legs used for walking the flipper of whale used for swimming the wing of bat used for flight so the functions are different but the origin the basic structure would be the same in all cases if you taking the four leg we have the acrom humerus the four are formed of two bones what is called radius and ulna the wrist is formed of corpus the palm is formed of actually metacarpals the digits are formed of phalanges the same basic fundamental structure was in all cases but they are greatly modified in order to in order to just to perform different functions that's why i say homologous organs have same origin same basic fundamental structure but performing different functions so there is a concept that is given so that inherited from the common ancestors 
with a similar developmental pattern in embryos. Examples of what I mentioned the following spirit. Even the mouth parts, we can say, of insects, like etc. So that is called homologous organs. The phenomenon is called homology. The phenomenon is called homology. So they represent what is called the divergent evolution. From one common ancestors, we have different forms have been evolved. That is called divergent evolution. Now the second one, under comparative morphology and anatomy, the evidence, analogous organs. Analogous organs. This is number two, analogous organs. So if you are taking the wing of bat, the wing of bird, and also the wing of an insect, butterfly, now, they have actually similar function. All these structures, wing in back, bird and insect, and the wings are used for flight. That's a common function. So, organs which have common function. But if you are analyzing the nature of development, the basic structure. So, the basic structure of back wing, the bird wing, the insect wing are different. And also the development different. So, organs which have different origin but performing common functions are called analogous organs and the phenomenon is called analogy. Analogy. So, in the book it is given organs which have similar in structure and similar in function are called analogous organs but their development but their origin would be different. Say an example. The wing of bat, wing of bird, wing of insect all perform similar functions but their mode of development different. This is number two. Number three, vestigial organs. These are all the organs that is normally in support of evolution in the form of evidences from morphology and anatomy. The third one, vestigial organs. Now this is all degenerated, that is reduced, and non-functional organs. Degenerated non-functional organs. But they were formed to be functional in other related organisms. So in their ancestors, the organs were functional and perfect, fully developed. But in course of time, because of disuse, the concept proposed by Lamar, because of disuse, the organs have become reduced in size, lost their perfectness, so non-functional. The following are the organs, the vestigial organs in human body, in human body. So there are about 180 vestigial organs in human body. There are about 180 vestigial organs. That's why human beings are called moving museum moving museum of antiquities moving museum of antiquity we have nearly 180 vestigial organs some of them are number one vermiform appendix vermiform appendix I will give you a picture in the video later, you can observe what is that one. The reduced appendix and cecum present at the junction of the small intestine and the large intestine. Then, nictitating membrane. Nictitating membrane. So, in our ancestors, we have or we had nictitating membranes used for closing the axis. But now, it is being reduced into a small lobe-like structure. This is the reduced, that is, nucleotidic membrane and that is called plica semilunaris. That is what is called a reduced nucleotidic membrane. The third one, ear pinna muscles. Ear pinna muscles. The ear lobe muscles. Ear pinna muscles. Our ancestors had the ability of just moving the ear lobes, but we don't. Because the ear in the muscles reduced, 
what are called auricular muscles and non function so that we cannot move the ear lobes then we have at the end of the vertebral column we have the caudal vertebrae are fused to form a reduced tail what is called coccyx reduced tail what is called coccyx it is also an example for that is vestigial arm even the presence of sparse hairs sparse rings a few hairs on the surface of the chest may that is also an example for vestigial arm the presence of wisdom teeth the last molar teeth which will develop only after the age of 21 It is not being used for grinding. The wisdom teeth is also an example for vestigial part. Wisdom teeth. So these are some of the examples for some of the examples for vestigial organs, degenerated non-functional organs present in the body without any functions. Now another one in comparative anatomy and morphology, atavism. What is atavism? This is. in support of evidences for evolution we have studied so far from comparative morphology and anatomy the homologous organs the number 2 analogous organs number 3 the vestigial organs number 4 atavism what is atavism the sudden reappearance of an ancestral character in an individual at birth the sudden reappearance of an ancestral character at the time of birth in a newborn baby or the race in an individual that is called atavism now we have a number of atavistic characters in our body so this is showing that one you have been descended from one ancestor that's why the character is taken now the fourth one atavism now the presence of dense hairs on the body in some people you could find just like gorilla or chimpanzee that is an ancestral character it is not present in all the individuals only in some individuals you could see some of the persons actors also the presence of dense hairs on the body number 2 the canine teeth elongated canine teeth in some people so canine teeth formed only in the case of our ancestors who just actually torn the flesh another one in some newborn babies not in all cases a rare instance a small stumpy tail is present at the back it is also what is called the reappearance of the ancestral character our ancestors had the tail and that was normally repeated and the reappearance is called atavism so i will show the pictures for the small stumpy tail you can see that one the vestigial organs the homologous organs and analogous organs the colorful pictures while we are passing through the videos the study of comparative embryology of different animals also in support of evolution if i comparing the embryos from fishes to mammals fishes to mammal from fishes to mammals if you are studying the comparative embryology of fishes to mammals all the embryos in the early stage of development were similar so they were similar in the early stages of development they undergo differentiation of special characteristics while during the later stage of development so you cannot differentiate the early embryos of fish a frog a reptile a bird and a man all are similar exactly alike so the special development the differentiation of special characters occurred only at the later stage of development 
So that is the concept evidences from comparative embryology that showed that all the individuals have a common ancestor. That means the monophyletic origin. Only one ancestor for all the animals because of actually the evidences from embryology. A person by name Ernst Haeckel proposed a law. Ernst Haeckel proposed a law. The name of the law is called biogenetic law or recapitulation theory. Recapitulation theory. What is the law? Ernst Haeckel proposed biogenetic law in relation to evidences from comparative embryology. The law is also called recapitulation theory. Now, what is the law? Antogeny recapitulates phylogeny. This is the law. Antogeny recapitulates phylogeny. This is the law. So, for that, you have to know the meaning of the two words antogeny and phylogeny. What is antogeny? The various stages that occur in the development of an individual is called antogeny. So it is the developmental history of an individual. Antogeny, the developmental history of an individual. Developmental history. Developmental history of an individual. Of an individual. Say an example if you are taking the development of frog, different stages. One of the stages during the development of frog is tadpole larva. So, we are studying the developmental history of an individual, taking a frog, we have the egg stage, then we have the larva stage, then the adult stage, different stages. And that is called antogeny. What is phylogeny? The developmental history. The developmental history of its ancestor, history of a species, or we can say ancestor, developmental history of an ancestor. See if you are taking the ancestor of frog. So the frog originated from the fishes. Frog originated from fishes. This is the ancestor. So if you are studying, so this is the development history of a species or the ancestor of what is called an individual. So the ancestor for frog, the fishes. Now during the development of frog, one of the stages, what is called tadpole larva, resembled the adult stage of the ancestor. So the tadpole larva looked like a fish, the adult stage of ancestor. So the development of an individual the various stages and development of an individual repeat the phylogeny or the ancestral character of an individual during its development. So this is called recapitulation. The meaning for that one, repetition, repeats. So the individual's developmental stages repeat the phylogenetic character of the ancestor. That means one of the stages that are called larva resemble the adult stage of ancestor, namely fishes. So, the fish character was repeated during the development of the race frog. That's antigen. If you are taking another example, say an example of caterpillar larva. The caterpillar larva looked like an annelid the earthworm. Okay? So, it originated, the arthropods or the insect originated from annelid earth-like individuals. So one of the stages namely caterpillar resembled the adult stage of ancestor like earthworm. There also we have antogeny repeats phylogeny. This is what is called antogeny in capitalist phylogeny. I repeat once again because it's somewhat different. One of the characters or stages during the development of an individual, that's antogeny, repeats the developmental history of an ancestor that is also called phylogeny. Here the tadpole larva resemble his ancestor the fishes. 
Okay, this is about evidences from embryology in support of evolution. Students, so far we have studied evidences from morphology, anatomy, embryology, etc. And all these evidences are indirect evidences. But the direct evidence is coming from what is called fossil. Direct evidence is coming from fossil. Now what are fossils? The fossils are the true witnesses of evolution. The direct documents of evolution. They only give what is the direct evidence, the true witness. Now the study of fossils is called paleontology. So the fossils are nothing but the remains of the past. Either in the form of actual modes or we have what is called actually there is an actual remains etc. So the fossils are actual remains or hardened into stones etc. We will be studying more about this one in higher classes. Simply the fossils are the remains of the past, lived organisms and actually they are dead mat. Now, the fossils study is called paleontology. The study of fossils is called paleontology. Now, it was first studied thoroughly by a person by name Leonard Darwin. He is called father of paleontology. He is called father of paleontology. So, he will be studying that is fossils in that is uh, more and more fossils, hence he is given the name Father of Paleontology. So we will be studying more and more later. What is the importance of these fossils? Now the study of fossils helps to understand the line of evolution, that is the lineage of evolution of many invertebrates and vertebrates. We have a number of direct fossil records, even one can know about the structure of Dinosaurs, the huge reptiles, only because of the fossil evidences. No one could see that is an animal dinosaur, only from the evidences of fossils. We have made the full animal diagram or a picture, or a graph. Now here, the fossil records show that the evolution has taken a process of changes from simple to complex organisms. Even the evolution of modern birds is supported by evidences from paleontology. The evolution of modern birds is supported by, that is, uh, from paleontology. This is about what's called paleontology, the study of fossils and about the fossils, etc. I have to mention one fossil bird, Archaeopteryx. A few words about Archaeopteryx. What is Archaeopteryx? So this is the oldest fossil bird, oldest fossil bird. Now there is no such bird at present, but we have, that is what's called stuffed specimen of the bird in Berlin Museum, Germany. Now this is a earlier form, earlier bird-like form that originated during Jurassic period. Jurassic period. So we can divide the entire earth period into different eras. For example, there is a hierarchy era. Each era is divided into what we call the periods. Each period is divided into what is called epoch. This is what is called hierarchy in geological time scale, the time scale of the earth period. One such era is Xenozoic era. Or I will take only this era, not others. Mesozoic era only I am taking. Mesozoic era. One of the eras. And this era is called as the age of reptiles. Reptiles were dominant during the period, hence called Mesozoic era. In that Mesozoic era, one of the period is Jurassic period. That's why the name of the film was given Jurassic Park. 
Now in Jurassic period, the origin of fossil bone, that is our capital is occurred. Now, it is a connecting link between reptiles and birds. Because of the possession of characters of both reptiles and birds, it is called a connecting link between birds and reptiles. Connecting link. This is one of the questions also. Connecting link between birds and reptiles. Because it possesses, it actually possesses, we can say because there is no such animal, it possesses both reptilian and avian characters. I want to compare only a few characters. What are the birds character? Birds character. Only one character I want to tell you. Presence of wings. Wings with feathers. The reptilian characters are one, the presence of long tail, two, conical teeth in beak because teeth are absent in birds, that is mouth, presence of clawed digits, again one of the characters of the reptile. So these are all the reptilian characters. As it possesses both birds and reptilian character, it is called a connecting link between reptiles and birds.